am I doing it now? If someone gives your company millions of dollars, they want to be very close by so that they can walk into your office and like see what you're doing. Всем привет! Добро пожаловать на канал ProBlock TV и Кремниевую долину. Меня зовут Вика. Рядом со мной Эндрю. Он американец. Привет. Программист. Немного говорит по-русски, но сегодня мы поговорим о его работе и будем говорить по-английски. Я надеюсь, что это натренирует ваш слух и будет полезным для вас. Но если вы не уверенно себя чувствуете в английском, то включайте субтитры и читайте русский перевод. For years, you was working for Palantir, right? And mm -hmm. uh, I think three or four. It is a big company, but now you are working for a startup. Mm -hmm. And uh, why? Why? Oh, why? Why did I leave the the safety <laughs> yeah. of the uh, yeah. of the mothership, uh, the nest, to sort of go off into this yeah. wilderness of startup insanity? There's a point as an engineer, while you're progressing through learning about different technologies, learning about different techniques. You get to a point where you want to understand something beyond just sort of the code in front of you. I mean, once you've gotten to a certain point in understanding that code, you feel comfortable with it enough that you want to start like maybe picking up some other interests along the way. And so I became interested in understanding a bit more about how the organization operates as a whole. Um, I wanted to understand how recruiting works uh, like on the inside. I wanted to understand how hiring works how pricing a contract for hiring someone works, to understand more about the sales pipeline, how customers are acquired, what the contract negotiation with customers looks like, how you design proof of concept, like uh, sort of like um, pilots with customers, um, how the marketing pipeline works, how you develop a social media campaign, uh, all of these different aspects of a mm -hmm. business. Um, what the different particular aspects are between the work that a person who's an engineer does as an individual contributor and the work that, say, a CTO or a director of engineering does. And at Palantir, the organization was large enough that I would never really be exposed to those facets. I wouldn't be exposed to the people in those positions in that organization enough to understand more about like what actually is happening there. I wanted to sort of break out of that safe place and go into this place that's like kind of like dangerous and uncertain and interesting to understand more about that. And when I was looking for a company, I chose the one that I ended up at based on the people being people that I thought I could work with, the compensation being enough that I felt like I could live with it, um, and the product being something that I actually believed could work. Uh, so I felt like I have the right sort of construction of a startup to, to feel comfortable working there. But at the same time, I'm gaining all these other things. So I'm achieving these other goals while I have this structure that like works for me. And so even though my you know, health insurance isn't as good as it was before, I don't get free food three times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I have like way fewer benefits in other aspects, like I don't have a free gym, I don't have like all these other things. I still feel pretty comfortable uh, in my day-to-day -day life, and the pressure is a little higher, and uh, the workload is a little more, I'm working longer hours, but I I'm okay with that kind of. I feel like I'm gaining some good understanding of how the industry operates as a whole. And I think I can use that down the road, either to maybe start my own business or, um, potentially just use that to increase my impact at any other company. I can, because I understand more about how the business operates as a whole, maybe I can use that to guide my engineering decisions a little better towards an optimal outcome for both like the engineering side of the house and the sales side of the house. You said what was important for you. Let's talk about negotiation. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's a very interesting uh, thing because when you, um, want to start uh, with a big company mm -hmm. like you can negotiate their uh, salary and maybe sign a bonus and uh, yeah and uh, you can negotiate think, everything yeah. and uh, what about startup oh at a startup i think you can still negotiate um i think they will tend to be a little more resistant to it in the sense that i mean a starving man is less willing to give you food right So like a startup that is, they don't necessarily need to be starving, but they do have like a limited amount of money. Uh, the company may only have enough money to continue operating for two years or one year even at that point, right? Before they have to go and get more funding. So for them to agree to give you more money is kind of like a little bit hard for them. They're probably more willing to give you more equity. Um, I think early-ish stage engineers tend to get like uh, 
0.15 to 0.2 percent of the company. Um, if you get in really early in the company and you're one of like the most critical engineers for the whole like project, you might be able to get you know a couple percent. I think it's pretty hard unless you're one of the founders to get more than a few percent of uh, a startup. I think that. In terms of negotiation, I think you can negotiate. I, I think that you can always negotiate. What does uh, the startup do? Uh, what do we do? Um, so we make a software product that helps smaller companies and medium-sized companies and potentially someday larger companies who don't want to build themselves this particular product. Um, we help them to do a thing called experimentation, uh, which if you think of companies like Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, these companies all have a ton of users. When they release a new feature, a change to some part of their product, like maybe how ads are displayed or the color of a button, um, they don't want to release it to all of the customers at once because if that has a problem with it, that prevents you know the website from working on maybe you know some particular browser or something, then they could end up impacting maybe 30% of the customers and that would really, really impact their reputation, their profitability. I mean, this is, this is a huge problem, right? And with thousands of engineers working on your product every day, you really can't release a feature uh, from you know, each of these engineers every day that is going to impact all of those people simultaneously. You, you will find bugs where two features interact in a way that's negative, right? Uh, that you couldn't find in test. Mm -hmm. And so the product that we provide allows people, allows companies, to release new features in their software to a small percentage of the total group of their, their customers, their users of their website. And then on top of that, we will measure lots of different data about those customers and how they use the site uh, for you. And you can, using this data, understand more about whether this feature improves the profitability of your product or if it decreases the profitability of your product. So an example of this is if you add more ads to maybe Google search, uh, you may find that after, you know, six months of uh, this new feature being deployed, your users have learned to be more blind to ads. They see, they, they don't look at the ads anymore completely. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a consequence, you've actually reduced the click-through rate for ads on your search engine, which is your primary source of revenue. You may find that reducing the ads actually has a beneficial effect of increasing people's uh, awareness of them because there's fewer ads in more like maybe random locations they're not expecting them there so they actually see the ad and maybe they recognize that it's something they want and they end up clicking it on it and and you know you get this higher click-through rate so very often the features that we produce that we write as engineers it's difficult to measure if they had a beneficial impact for the company so we provide a tool that allows companies to do that so they don't have to build this technology internally at the company. The goal, the like mission, the total mission of the company as a whole is to actually power like the world's decisions, uh, software-based decisions, using this data. So it's kind of like a pretty like high-minded, sort of like glorious uh, kind of goal, but um, the day-to-day the -day work of the company is selling a software product to other companies that they use to release features safely and also in a way that they can measure the performance of those features. Not, not performance like uh, speed, but performance in terms of um, the profitability of the company. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about a difference between uh, working process in a big company in, uh, and uh, a startup. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's so different. <laughs> in a larger company, I think, it's a little slower. There's less pressure. At Palantir, the deadlines kind of all seemed a little bit made up. Um, like there wasn't like a real pressure from the outside to deliver something. Uh, unless you were working more on like the front lines of the company. Sometimes there was some pressure, but the deadlines still felt a little bit made up. Whereas in a startup, I think you have much more real deadlines. Uh, you might have customers that are waiting on a feature to be finished so that they'll buy your product. Like maybe they've told you, like once you have this feature in your platform, we want to we want to start buying your product. And if you are the engineer that's writing that feature, because your engineering team is very small and you can't assign more than one person to it, um, that that means there are you know potentially thousands of dollars of revenue for the company that are waiting on your work. So the faster you get it done, the faster you produce that work, 
um, the more money your company gets. And it's mm -hmm. very real. It's, yeah. I mean, it's right there in front of you. You can like calculate it on a piece of paper exactly how much money is being produced by the work you're doing. It's quite different, I'd say. The day-to-day -day work is very different. At a startup, you have much more input on all kinds of decisions. Uh, like one thing that I had a little bit of input into um, recently was the decision of which 401k provider to go with. Um, I, I'm realizing now that in your audience might not be familiar with what a 401k is. So that's like a, it's a financial plan that a company provides you that allows you to save for retirement, kind of like a, a personally managed pension plan. And uh, private companies sell these to companies. So I actually had some input on a decision like that, which is obviously not a software decision at the company, right? I've talked, I've been able to talk with people about which office we're moving to next, things like this. So I feel like I have a voice and an opinion that I can sort of provide in decisions that aren't related at all to software, which I would never have at Palantir. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine, uh, you know, somebody at Facebook, an engineer saying, yeah, I think we should move to this building like next year. It wouldn't really, their voice wouldn't, would have no, it would be just a giant like hall of silence, right? Like no one has a voice yeah, except for the team right. working on it. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you have way more impact. It feels really cool. I like that. What do you think about um, Silicon Valley as a, as a place, a <clears throat> tech mecca, mm. why um, it became? That's a history question. I'm not, I don't think I'm well equipped to answer it. Uh, I don't know why it became a technology. Why well, a lot of uh, startups uh, want to start business, to develop business here. Ah, today? Yeah. Um, okay, so that, the investors are here. I mean, that's really what it is. <laughs> uh, if someone gives your company millions of dollars, they want to be very close by so that they can walk into your office and like see what you're doing. And they can come in and like talk to you, the founder, if they have a question or if they want to have a board meeting, they don't want to have to travel very far for it and they want it to be like in person. So I think a big motivating factor for many companies being here in Silicon Valley is that the investors are here. Another reason for that is that the industry here, the, the tech industry here has a lot of momentum already. And what I mean by momentum is that if you have tons of engineers uh, working for companies in an area, companies want to start their company there because there's a larger availability of engineers in that area because engineers are trying to go there because they want to be in the tech mecca. Your engineers will tend to perform, I think, a little better than engineers in other areas because on weekends, if they go out to the bar, they might overhear a conversation of two people talking about some technology. Um, you know, what I'm trying to say with that anecdote is that the engineering culture is so dense in that area that they're constantly they have inputs from other engineers, other organizations, other signals that provide them with information and learning about the thing that they're doing for work every day. And so because they're exposed to so much more, this cross-pollination happens between organizations. So if Facebook yeah. develops a new technology, I'll probably hear about it before the guys on the East Coast will. If I do hear about it before the guys on the, guys on the East Coast and I'm competing with them, then maybe I can implement this new technology at my company uh, and as a consequence, be able to drive revenue at my company faster than the company on the East Coast can and outcompete them in the market. It is say that Americans are very good in, uh, in uh, presenting and selling themselves in the interview. Oh. You as an American. <laughs> <laughs> am I doing it now? Is this, <laughs> yeah. Am I, am I selling myself? Uh, um, for example, uh, I am recruiter mm -hmm. and I call you and say, Andrew, please tell me about yourself. Hmm. I don't know if this is true for all Americans, but I would tend to want to present like sort of the best version of myself in a conversation like that. So if they say, tell me about yourself, I, I'm not going to tell them bad things, obviously. Um, I'm not going to say, well, I'm good at this, but you know, all of these problems. Uh, I'm probably just gonna say, well, you know, I'm this person that's interested in these things. I like this, and this is what I do with most of my time. I'm gonna try to be honest, but um, presenting really the things that are like beneficial, I think. Uh, I mean, it's... Can we, like, let's conduct a master class, for example. We could. You want uh, to change your job right now. Okay. And uh, what um, are you going to say to recruiter? If I wanted to be recruited by another company, the first thing I would do is I would go and I would update my LinkedIn with what I think uh, the company that I want to recruit me is looking for. Um, so I would go and I would read their job postings 
And then I would use information from their job postings to sort of update my LinkedIn to, to just be a little bit more tailored for that audience. Um, I'd probably update my resume in a similar fashion. So I do like a little bit of preliminary work to make sure that like the version of me I'm presenting is the version that suits what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, following that, I might spend some time uh, reading more about the company's product, how it works, to understand the kinds of problems that a person in that role at that company would face. Uh, and so to understand more about maybe what their challenges are. When I understand their challenges, I might try and go read up on the cutting edge of like the current solutions for those challenges. Um, if I can, an ideal sort of uh, thing to have in that situation is a friend who works at a similar company that produces something similar that I can talk to at length about their company and the challenges they face. Um, it may not line up perfectly, but it'll give you more context to understand the other company from. And then sort of at the end of this sort of long process of analysis, I would, I would then take the step to either contact them directly or try and get their recruiter to contact me. It's not ideal if you reach out to them first. I think if they reach out to you, it's ideal because from their perspective, it looks more random. Yeah. Um, it looks more like they've found you and not that you've come looking for them. Because if they think that they've found you, but you know all this stuff about their industry and their company and like all this you know, related context, for them, they feel like they've found a really great candidate. Um, and I think that that lubricates the interview process a little better. It creates a smoother transition from the initial contact with the recruiter into the idea that maybe this person is a good candidate, a good fit for this company. Why do you think uh, Americans are so good in self-presentation? Mm, do you have question. any classes at school? Like, <laughs> no? Do we have any classes on it? No, not really. Because I Russian is mm. not good in self-presentation, Yeah, uh, maybe, I think. Hmm. It's a good question. I, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've heard so in my travels abroad, in China, Russia, wherever, um, I've sort of heard that Americans are very kind of like energetic, that we sort of like, like are kind of like a little bit uh, crazy even, that we stand out a little bit because our behavior is a little bit strange or like maybe we're too happy, <laughs> things like this. I don't know, I, maybe the culture just like encourages that. And so we just have this, maybe this, this energy, I guess all the time. Um, Maybe we, we learn it from a very young age. Where do we learn it? Why do we learn it? I don't know. You know, it's, it's strange. I don't, really, I don't really understand it myself. I think it's but a part of your culture. Yeah, it might just be a part of our culture. Um, I mean, they put fluoride in our water. So I, and I mean this entirely as a joke, of course, but they put fluoride in the water because it helps with like, the health of your teeth. Um, you know, maybe it's that, maybe it's fluoride in the water. Maybe it makes us all like a little crazy. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Um, I certainly don't. Would you imagine that you work for a Russian tech company in Russia? I'm mm. not here. So I've considered it actually. Um, mm -hmm. I've not considered any specific company, but I've, I've considered the idea of it just because um, one, it would be interesting for me. Two, I would get to work on my Russian, which is very bad. And I'd really like the opportunity to sort of like become very good at that because, uh, you know, I mean, I'll have kids and stuff someday. And Anyway, my wife's parents live in Russia, uh, and so I've thought about maybe going and working somewhere in or around their city um, to, to sort of be closer to them, which would be cool for me, cool for Kaita, uh, but also because it would be interesting for me for a lot of other reasons. So again, this is kind of like a breaking outside of your comfort zone to experience something that's really interesting and different um, that you can use to sort of improve yourself, I guess. I've considered it. I don't know if I could actually do it, um, I'd have to get a working visa, a bunch of other things. Yeah. Uh, I don't know where the Russian tech companies are. I don't know how their salaries line up with like the cost of living in those areas. You know, I don't know what that would look like long term. Let's say I do that at the end of that time period. If I want to come back to America, if I've saved up less money over that time period, then my savings when I'm back here in America might be like much reduced from what they would be if I was living if I'd lived here the whole time, working the whole time. So it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing to justify from a financial standpoint because I think the salary would probably be lower, but maybe there's like a job at some Russian company in Russia where I'm acting as sort of like a liaison between like the American side of the company and like the Russian side of the company, but that's probably not software related. I don't know. It doesn't seem like there's a good role that I would fit into that would satisfy all of these different concerns, but I have considered it. 
um, it's a difficult choice. Yeah. In the end of uh, this interview, could you recommend uh, some uh, like sites for learning something that you oh. use? So I know like that websites? you. Yeah, maybe yeah, websites okay. or maybe sure. books. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think it depends on what you want to learn. Uh, it always depends on what you want to Could learn. Could you do you have uh, any recommendation about you know, what learn uh, to work in Silicon and Valley? So, oh yeah. So a lot of the software engineering skills that I learned, I learned um, actually not through courses at my university because I want to be clear that I didn't major in a computer. Like the, the thing I studied at my university was not a computer science degree, so I didn't mm -hmm. actually spend um, very much time in any of my classes writing software. Uh, I wrote a little bit of software. Um, during my undergrad. I did go out of my way to sort of like kind of learn on the side some software engineering. I hung out with some people who were studying software engineering um, and I, I spent some time online on uh, MIT has a website called Open Courseware, so MIT OCW, mm -hmm. um, where you can take uh, their classes essentially for free online anytime you want. They just have all the lectures as videos. They have the books that are recommended for the course. They have the homework that's recommended, the syllabus. Um, sometimes they have the answers. Sometimes they have the tests as well. So you can basically take that course as if it was taught by an MIT professor um, online for free in your own time. And the only thing that you don't have is access to that human, that professor that you can ask questions to when you don't understand something. But because we have the internet, which is like this like second brain that we all share, mm -hmm. um, you can sort of like use the internet to find a place to answer that question. So I think MIT OpenCourseWare, if you're trying to learn something about software engineering, is probably the best, without question, the best place to learn very strong fundamental skills for writing software. If you want to go beyond fundamentals and get more into something a bit industrial, like skills that might be um, not more relevant for working as a software engineer, but more targeted for that kind of uh, situation. There are some courses on Coursera that are a little more practical. Um, so they tend to be things like, we're going to do you know, laboratory exercises throughout the entire semester, working on one specific topic to develop one specific outcome so that you understand how to do one type of like workflow. I think that those courses can be useful in specific contexts, but I think if you're learning fundamentals like MIT OpenCourseWare is the best. If you need to brush up on like really basic skills like uh, lower level education like mathematics or maybe just basic um, trigonometry or financial skills or something like this, um, I think uh, Salman Khan made this thing called Khan Academy, which breaks everything down into very easy language. It's very easy to understand. Uh, so it really depends on what you're looking to learn about. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, no for the interview. Yeah. Well, And thank you for interviewing me. Спасибо, Андрю. Спасибо. Спасибо ты. Да. Тебе. Тебе. А тебе? Спасибо тебе. И спасибо вам за то, что вы досмотрели это видео. Я надеюсь, что оно вам понравилось. Спрашивайте в комментариях, если у вас есть какие-то вопросы. Я думаю, что Эндрюс туда заглянет и, возможно, даст ответы. На этом все. Подписывайтесь на канал. Всем пока. Пока.